So very, very much. I just would like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora clan on whose land we stand today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Thank you so much. I mean, I do love this space because about a year, in February last year, we put on a very, very special event called the CEO Cook-Off. And yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> We invited 130 CEOs, we had 35 chefs, and we invited the CEOs to pay a lot of money to participate, to work together in groups with the chefs, and we invited a thousand of our recipients, our homeless, disadvantaged people, and the CEOs and the chefs cooked and served a meal to our thousand people in Cathedral Square. Our corporate partner with that for that is Qantas. And at that event, I had the pleasure of meeting Vince Frost. He didn't know what he was in for when he met me. <laughs> but the point is, that event raised us over $900,000. It's been pretty successful. I will say that this year in February, we went over a million dollars. And if there are any business leaders, thank you. If there are any business leaders in this room that want to participate next year, it will be in February. Um, we're waiting on the date from Qantas, and it's a very, very special event. Anyway, I met Vince, so this space is very special because when I said we needed to do an annual report, he said, I'll think about it. He didn't actually. He said yes. and and. Quite honestly, if any of you have ever seen an annual report that looks like this, you can, I mean, I, I was a guest speaker at, around the country at the CPA's conference, Chartered Accountants, and I all said, guys, would you like to see my annual report? And there wasn't exactly an overwhelming roar <laughs> until I said, well, this is it. And honestly, they just went, wow, and, and I gave it away. So. Yeah, so thanks Vince and Frost and the magnificent team because together they've rebranded, helped us rebrand. And I guess I want to share a little bit about Oz Harvest. I'm going to share a little bit about who we are, what we are, why we are Australia's most favorite, one of Australia's most favorite charities. Um, and considering that we are eight and a half years old, um, I think that we've managed to grow quite significantly in that time and we have not managed to grow like this because of me, it's because of the team and the amazing people that we brought on board and so I'm very mindful of that and very proud to be the leader of this extraordinary group of people and team. In fact, when I decided to start Oz Harvest, so 10 years ago I'd been running my own business, I had an event production company and was putting on events for major companies, Optus, Combank, Virgin, Qantas. And one of the things that was common at each and every one of my events was stunning amounts of food because I never liked going to an event and standing over here and the canapes were over there <laughs> and then having to go to Macca's on the way home because I was so starving. So my events were abundant, generous, filled with food because that made my clients look magnificent. And my clients then thought that I was great because they looked good. And so constantly I was a source of an enormous amount of food. And every now and again when I could, I would take that food on my way home to the one shelter that I knew, which was the Matthew Talbot home right behind the Porsche, the Ferrari, the Rover dealers. I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's quite a confronting place to go to late at night by yourself with a couple of trays of food, stepping over bodies and 
that, that mass of humanity, men of all shapes, sizes, and ages, hanging around that place. So when I reached a point in my life that what I wanted to do was make a significant difference, when I realized that actually there had to be a reason other than putting on magnificent events for companies that I had been put on this earth, I looked at what I knew and what I had done. I still don't know why I didn't go and volunteer at the Cancer Council, but I'm very grateful that I didn't. Um, and I figured that what I know is food and what I know is that there are people in need and if I could connect those two, it could possibly be a good thing. And it seems like it has been. It took a year to set up Oz Harvest and in November 2004, our first van left an office. It was white because I couldn't afford yellow and it had written on it, Oz Harvest, Rescuing Food for the Charities of Sydney. And in that month, we rescued the equivalent of 13,000 meals and delivered it to six different agencies. And I promise you, I pinched myself black and blue because I had thought that this would take forever. And I didn't mind if it had taken forever, but there it was happening and in the city. Last month, May... 2013. We delivered 480,000 meals to 520 different organizations. So we've grown somewhat. <laughs> so I guess it's been an incredible journey. And, and when I say that I was a little bit like the Pied Piper, it was because when I decided to start Arts Harvest, it wasn't that I had an idea that no one had had before. I guess what it was that I took an idea and put it into action because it seemed that why wouldn't I? Why couldn't I? And nothing was going to stop me. And so I was a little bit like the Pied Piper because I am 100% sure that if I ask each and every one of you, and what we have here in this room is a mass of people from different countries, different cultures, but if I ask each and every one of you, if your mum or your nan or somebody when you were growing up said to you, eat your food because there's someone starving somewhere, I'm going to get a lot of people nodding and saying, yes, that happened to them. I mean, in my life, my mother told me there were people starving in China. Now, from my accent, you might hear that I was from South Africa. She didn't even know they were around the corner. I could have sent my peas there instead of having to fight and think how I was going to send them to China. <laughs> but the point is that it has been an extraordinary journey. And when I think about the people that have come on board to help me along the way, it, it's, it's been an ex a wonderful lesson and a wonderful, for me, I come from a place of abundance and generosity. I have never ever felt that what we are is a charity and I need to go around to anybody and ask with my cap in hand for whether it's food or whether it's vehicles or whether it's annual reports or whether it's to build those relationships. I am so firm and convinced in my mind that giving is so much more valuable and enriching than getting. And I feel incredibly comfortable to go to anybody, and I mean anybody, and ask for something for this purpose. Because I believe that right now, this purpose is a very important one. Um, and so when initially I realized that what I want to do, and I had never done this, and it wasn't that when I was a little girl growing up, all I ever thought about was one day I was going to start a charity. Trust me, I was going to be an air hostess. It sounded so glamorous, you know. I was going to travel the world and serve people food. Anyway, I never got to do that. But the point is that there is absolutely no doubt that one of the strengths, I think, of Oz Harvest, apart from our, the strength of our brand and what we've managed to do, was that from day one, I treated Oz Harvest like a business just didn't occur to me that because we were, I don't even, I won't even call us a not-for-profit. As far as I'm concerned, what a cheek to call our sector not-for-profit. We have enormous profit. It's just not measured in dollars. Our profit is in social outcome. 
So why should I be a not-for-profit? A business that makes bus money isn't called a for-profit. You know, you don't go around and say, well, I'm a for-profit if you're Qantas or if you're whatever. And anyway, a lot of them don't make money. But the point is, the point is, I have a huge social outcome. So I say we're either a for-purpose or a for-impact because that's what, how we measure ourselves. And one of the other strengths that I think I realized right very early on was that if I had a measurable, if I could measure our value, if I could show people all the time what our value was, then they'd be willing to invest in us. And I call it investment. I don't call it a donation. Because the investment in what we do is changing the way Australia Functions. Us, Us Harvest was the first organization that made, a, made the whole area of waste and the collection of perishable food. Um, uh, we were the first organization to do that. And, you know, that positioning was very strong. Timing was good, yeah, but, you know, it could have been any time. I've had so many people over the last 10 years tell me I'm so lucky. I've been so lucky because I was really just in the right place at the right time. I, my answer generally to that is I think I was really lucky that I was born to the parents I was born to. They were incredibly good, moral, kind people, and I didn't have a choice. That was luck. I was very lucky to be born in South Africa quite during the apartheid era. You couldn't have planned that, but that was lucky. But I wasn't really lucky to start Oz Harvest. It was a conscious decision to find a way to find and tap into what my purpose in life was. So when the first person opened a door and said, why don't you go and speak to the Macquarie Foundation to try and get some seed funding, because I knew that I needed money, and I walked into that meeting, it wasn't like I was trained to do this, what I had been trained to do was to sell dreams. I mean, I'd come to someone who wanted an event, and I'd tell them that I was going to produce an extraordinary event and for an extraordinary amount of money. And they'd say, so what is it going to look like? And I'd say, well, we have two choices. I can tell you what it's going to look like, or you can put on your event this week and pay me, and we'll do it again for the real thing. And they had to trust and believe me. So I guess when I walked into Macquarie and said what I was going to do was start a food rescue organization, and they said, um, oh, that sounds like a brilliant idea, and how are you going to do it? And I said, well, I'd seen a model because I had heard about an organization. The universe transpires to bring you what you need when you're in the right place. When I was looking to set up Oz Harvest, I heard about an organization in America that was doing something similar, and I called my sister who lives in America and said, every time I call this organization, they say to me, if you have food, leave your number. I said, you've got to find me the founder of this organization because I need to speak to them because I need to see what they're doing. So I flew to, a, she said, all right, come, she knows me. I flew to America got off the plane at the airport. I said, so have you got a mobile number or somewhere I can call? She said, do you think we could go home first? I said, no, because I've got to find this person. Of course, that person was in Los Angeles. I met them, saw the model. So when I was sitting in front of Macquarie, I said, well, I've seen a model, so I know that it can work. It's been working there for 15 years, so that's what I'm going to base it on. So I didn't exactly have a business plan. I didn't exactly tell them that this and this and this. I spoke it through. And what I heard Julie White, the head of the foundation, say was, well, I think it's a great idea. And I heard her say yes. So I walked out of that meeting and said, yes, I've got Macquarie Bank. They're going to invest in us. And a day later, I got a phone call from Julie White. Who are you telling that I'm giving you money when I haven't even agreed to give you money? I said, yeah, but you are going to, aren't you? She said, yes, but I hadn't told you yet. <laughs> Anyway, so there's absolutely no doubt that a track record and having a corporate of that stature on board as a seed funder opened other doors for me. There's another thing that I know over the years I've been told, and I don't actually know why or how, but apparently passion is very, very compelling and compulsive, and um, people love people who are passionate. And again, 
I just love what I do. I'm just so excited and thrilled and it doesn't matter what day of the week it is and it doesn't matter as the years go by and I get more and more opportunities to do what I do, I feel so blessed. It seems that that is an infectious thing and so people want to come on board with us. But to go back to the measure, to go back to what it is that I believe is the magic that we have. So the magic is first of all that I didn't have to teach anybody that what we're doing is the right thing. The second thing is I can measure, I could right from the beginning I could say that I went to a nutritionist and said how much if I get this amount of food, what does it equate to in meals? Because our model is that we collect bulk food. So to give you an idea of what's happening in this world of ours in Australia, 7.8 billion dollars worth of food goes to waste every year in Australia. That's here. Okay, that's a lot of food going to waste. So I knew that if I could say that for every dollar we receive we can deliver X amount of meals, so in the beginning for every dollar we could receive we could deliver a meal. And slowly I would say for just under a dollar we could deliver a meal. Right now for 48 cents we can deliver a meal. And it's 48 cents because we've just opened in Melbourne so it takes us a little bit of time to build up but Melbourne is going beautifully. So it just means that it skews my number so I'd always say for less than a dollar you can deliver a meal. So I want to throw a challenge out to you. If I give you a dollar can you find anything better that you could do for a dollar than to give it to me to provide two meals to people in need? And if you can, do it. If you can't, give me the dollar. <laughs> so I guess the beautiful thing is that when I started Oz Harvest, Macquarie gave me that seed funding and they had a foundation. The next company I went to, through opening the doors to Macquarie and I'll share that it was quite an interesting meeting. I walked into a boardroom and there were 12 men sitting around a table and it was the Goodman Foundation, Goodman, Greg Goodman, Goodman Plus. Then it was Macquarie Goodman and Macquarie said, go and see Greg Goodman. So I walk in and there are 12 men sitting in black suits around a boardroom table. And I walk in and I say, hi, my name's Ronnie Khan and I'm here to tell you that what I'm about to do is I'm going to start a food rescue organization and I'm here to ask, and Greg puts up his hand and he says, what do you want? <laughs> I said, well, my office is in Alexandria and you've got office space and I need an office right near my office so that I can continue my business and run and start this charity. About three seconds later, he said, okay, fine, I'll give you an office. I said, oh, that's amazing. So I, I was about to turn and go out and he says, so what else do you need? I said, I need a van. He said, okay, I'll give you a van. So now I was really about to walk out and he said, so what else do you need? Now I hadn't come prepared for anything other than the office. I said, two vans. <laughs> he said, okay. I said, I'm out of here. So they gave me my first two vans. And so it has continued that I believe that by sharing, by sharing the value that these businesses have invested and when Greg invested in us they didn't have a foundation so nine years ago it was just the very beginning of corporate social responsibility so other companies that came on board came on board because they loved the idea and very early on people told me people give money to people they like people give money to causes they like people give money last for the tax donation and you know I've always remembered that because you know, yes, a tax donation is fantastic, but you're not going to go and give your money to something if you don't believe in the cause or you don't believe that the people who are going to manage that cause are going to do it well. So the businesses that have come on board have come on board and I believe and every single day I will share the joy and the value that those businesses have brought me. So, you know, when when Paul Newman, so Paul Newman Foundation gave us money um, and I make a point of going around and telling everybody who gives us money, why they give us money and I've had one, one funder in the whole time knock me back because 
the way I share that, I say, this is who we are, this is what we do, this is how much money we've got in our bank. So to me, if you were going to invest in me, I'd want to know that I had a little bit of money in the bank to run my business, at least for the next six months or the least year. Most charities often go from hand to mouth. And when you go with a sob story and say, I need money because we need to do this, this, and this. I've had one funder knock me back who said, if you've got six months funding, I'm not going to give you money. And I turned around to him and I said, if that's the way you invest in social organizations, then we're not the right partner for you. I don't want your money because would you prefer that I come back to you in two months' time and say, I've used up that money, please give me more again right now? Or would you rather that I was responsible about how we run our business? So we're very transparent and, and there are very few organizations that can give the value proposition that for every dollar that you donate or invest in our business, we can supply at least, now it's at least two meals to disadvantaged Australians. I guess what was interesting along the way was early in 2005, after having started our business, a couple of chefs, a couple of food producers said, oh, look, I'm a little worried about giving you food. I don't know what's going to happen. It hasn't been done yet. Somebody's going to sue me. So we lobbied, and in 2005, we had the Civil Liabilities Amendment Act passed in, two, in, in New South Wales to allow good food to be given away for free to charities without any fear of liability to the food donor. In 2008, we had that law amended in the ACT, and in 2009, we had that law amended in Queensland and South Australia. So, again, those are the things that have kind of changed the face of what happens to food waste here in Australia. And the whole notion of perishable food being a resource and not just waste has changed the way Australians look at, at waste. Um, when I started Oz Harvest, what I wanted to do was save food and feed people. It didn't occur to me until the first, second, and third month when I started seeing the amounts of food that we would collect as to the environmental impact of the food that we collect. I was just telling Christine over here that there's a business in Sydney that for seven years I've tried to knock on their doors and get them to give us their surplus leftover fruit and veg. And for seven years, they knocked me back. And actually, their CEO came to the CEO cook-off last year. And a week after, their business manager called and said, we'd like you to pilot collecting the surplus from our fruit and veg stores from three of them. And we'll give it a go, and we'll let you know they have 18 stores. We said, we'll give it a go for three, for about, for a month, or we'll pilot it for two months, and then we'll see. And after three weeks, they called and said, will you collect from all 18 stores? <laughs> we said, sure, no problem whatsoever. And after four months, their business manager told me that we had saved their business $225,000 in food waste disposal. So on the one hand, we're saving businesses money. So I will share with you that I actually, I lied when I said I got knocked back. I went to that business. I mean, if you've just told me you've saved $225,000 in four months, what is a, a person like me supposed to do? <laughs> so I go back to them with this brilliant pitch of giving their fruit and veg for a program to teach people how to eat healthy fruit and veg. And I didn't even ask for $225,000. I asked for $75,000, and they knocked me back. So we collect their food, but they're not my most favorite business partner. <laughs> um, so... That's on the one hand. On the other hand, every time we deliver food to agencies, we save them money and they can then redistribute their funding to other programs. So the average medium-sized organization, and we deliver to organizations like the Salvos, Uniting Care, Wesley, and, th and, and hundreds that you've never heard of that have either youth at risk or single mums or domestic violence or organizations that have the most minuscule 
extraordinary budgets to survive on so that when we bring them food, it saves them money. So the average that we save a small organization is about fifty to sixty thousand dollars a year that they can then redirect, and the larger ones over a hundred thousand. So I guess you know if if you want to know personally what this journey's been like, it's clearly been the most rewarding thing I have ever done in my life. I feel extremely privileged and blessed to be doing what I do. When the United Nations chose that this year their campaign for the World Environment Day and for this year is Think, Eat, Save, which is a campaign to save, to stop food waste globally. Um, and they heard about us. We are the Australian partner of the United Nations. Um, we will be holding an event in Martin Place on the 29th of July. So yesterday was World Environment Day, so there were you know, people talking about it all day yesterday. But on the 29th of July, we haven't yet decided, we will be doing small events in the other cities. That, so we'll, we're in Melbourne, Adelaide, Brisbane, um, where are we? Sydney, Newcastle. Um, we will, um, we're putting on an event here in Sydney that is called Feed the 5,000, and we will be feeding 5,000 members of the public, and I hope all of you, a meal that is made from surplus. So we will be using surplus veg, wonky carrots and ugly um, onions and ugly potatoes, because we all have to learn and change our behavior and change our habits to eating fruit and veg that is not cosmetically perfect. And I'll tell you about how much food you all waste and we all waste. But so this meal will be prepared from fruit, veg, and, and food that is surplus. We will serve 5,000 veggie curries and rice. We will, a couple of, two weeks ago, we got a call from a supplier saying they had 3,000 liters of cream. And we thought we could give everyone cholesterol heart failure in our organizations and send them out plain cream, or we could do something with it. So we called some of our partners, Pepe Sayo Butter, we called Brasserie Bread, and they said, why don't we make bread and butter puddings? So last Friday, 30 volunteers went into the Brasserie Kitchen, Brasserie Bread Kitchen at 4 a.m., and at 1 o'clock they had produced 17,400 bread and butter puddings. 12,000 were delivered out on Friday night and Saturday to all around New South Wales. And 5,000 have been frozen and will be given out on the 29th of July as part of that campaign. So that event is taking place in Amsterdam. I will be at the one in Amsterdam on the 29th of June just to see what they do. And then in Rio, Paris, Sydney, uh, New York, around the world. So that's a very exciting partnership for us because, yeah, the UN is the UN. And so, <laughs> so we're very proud of that. I guess um, I wanted to just tell you that in terms of waste, the statistics say that one in every five shopping bags that we purchase, we waste. If you can think about your own lives, you go into the supermarket, you buy lettuce, you buy this, you buy herbs, you buy that, you intend to cook it that night, somebody calls and says, not going to be home. Comes a week later, and we take the sludge from the bottom of our fridge, and we throw it away, and we're throwing away fuel and water and embedded energy, and that's how we all waste. We need to buy local, we need to buy less, we need to buy with our eyes and not with our tummies. We need to be much more, even the busiest of us can plan better and purchase better because until we stop doing that, nothing is going to change. It's not the supermarket's fault. They stock bread until midnight because we want to walk into a supermarket any time of the day and pick up what we want. And that is why 
thousands of loaves of bread go to waste every day because we want the luxury of being able to pick one when we feel like it. And bread might look cheap, and even we cannot get rid of all the bread that there is. And the pigs are eating bread. Now, pigs were not made to eat bread, nor were the cattle made to eat the things that they eat. So we won't even go there. But I can tell you that Australia has the capacity to produce food for 60 million people. And we are wasting most of it. And the challenge to the world today is not that there isn't enough food. It's that the food is not being distributed, is not getting to where we need to get it. So we have some major challenges in the world today, but actually the buck stops with us. And each and every one of us, every time we point to someone, there are three fingers pointing back at us, and we need to remember that. So what, you know, what can you all do? You're all in business. I would imagine... I don't know, and I'm pretty sure that each and every one of you is already doing quite a lot in your community. But if you're not, I need to tell you that today's the day to start. You just have to read today's paper. You have to read yesterday's paper. It doesn't matter which newspaper. Last year, when that beautiful young boy, Thomas Keller, 18, went to the cross with his girlfriend for the first time on a Friday night and was killed. Do you think that morning he went and left his home and said, Hey, Mom, cheers, because today is the last day of my life? No. So every time we think that we've got for the rest of our lives to do what it is that we plan to do, when we want to have the house that's bigger, the first house I bought in Sydney cost $180,000, but I want to tell you that the house I really wanted was two hundred and ten. If I'd have just had that extra $30,000, I'd have had the house of my dreams. And the next house I bought was three hundred and forty. but what I really wanted was four fifty. And the next house I bought, you know, was seven hundred. but the one I wanted was 1.1. And so it goes on. How many rooms can I live in? How many shoes can I wear? And I do love shoes. <laughs> and how many earrings can I have? And I love earrings. But the truth is, the time is now. And I just truly believe that it doesn't matter how big the size of your contribution, and I'm not even talking about financial contribution. It's about tiny little acts of kindness that ripple out into the community and make a huge difference. I can tell you that by Frost doing this for us, it has opened doors that are beyond what Vince and the team thought when they produced an amazing annual report for us. Every time I walk in and show this to somebody, they smile. It opens a conversation. It just a thousand things happen. And yes, it's got our facts and figures in it. I mean, it does happen to be the most extraordinary design ever, especially for people who can't read with needs bigger print. <laughs> But, but no, seriously, I mean, I don't know what they're going to do this year. Where's Anna and where's the team? Boy, you better be thinking about something brilliant to come after this. But it is about making a difference. It is about finding people to partner with. And it's about doing it because it's the right thing to do. Yes, your businesses will benefit. Yes, it might feel like it's a drain on your business and it might feel like it's costing you money and you're putting your hand in your pocket. It will all equal out in the end. I just first of all want to say that I do thank Vince for inviting me today, but also for doing for the team. You know, they treat us like a full paying client. And that kind of respect and dignity is incredible because we take up a lot of their time. And trust me, I think if he'd have realized how much time, he might have thought differently. Because first it was the annual report, and then, of course, it was our business cards. And then it was when Bruce Springsteen called and said, I'm coming to town, and I care very much about food waste. So I'm going to stand up on stage and say, Australians should donate to charities that service homeless people. We called Frost and said, we need something urgently next week because Bruce Springsteen's coming to town and we're going to be there. And look what he came up with. Everybody's got a hungry heart. Now, is that not divine? <laughs> look at it. And that's now become our 
like mantra, I tell people, of course everybody's got a hungry heart, come, come work with us. But it's that kind of capacity. So, um, yeah, I can tell you, so I can tell you anything more you would love to know. I just know that we just, last week I was in Canberra um, with a new project, um, visiting Parliament House, which is, I have to say, I felt incredibly patriotic. Walking through Parliament House is pretty beautiful. There are, I mean, I, honestly, I would have kissed the ground. I feel like the most lucky Australian in the world walking around Parliament House. But I did have a meeting with one of our ministers and presented a, a, a project called NEST, Nutrition Education Sustenance Training, a rollout to teach vulnerable, disadvantaged Australians how to eat better, how to cook, how to purchase better and how to change the way they eat so that it changes the lives and health of vulnerable Australians. Two million Australians do not have a square meal a day. One million kids go to bed without dinner and school without breakfast. That's here in this magnificent country of ours. So I went to pitch for the submission and at 11 o'clock in the morning, and four o'clock in the afternoon, I was at Canberra Airport and I got a phone call saying, we'll be sending you through the papers. You need to sign them by midday tomorrow. I mean, who would have thought the government could work so fast? <laughs> but anyway, there will be a big announcement about it, but, but we will be able to roll out that program. Part of our new branding is that this is what we now do. Our purpose is to nourish our country which I absolutely love because I started off and what we wanted to do was feed people and we feed people and that is our core mission to rescue good food and feed people. But under nourishing our country, it allows me to do so much more. We've got an, an education program called Nourish which will be launched in the next few months where we take disadvantaged kids and teach them hospitality and put them into all of the food donors who give us food so we can commit to jobs. The biggest dis disincentive to youth, disadvantaged youth, to go into any of the TAFE courses, to go into study, is they just don't believe they'll ever get a job. And they're right. The chances of getting a job are damn difficult. But we've got our thousands of food donors who've committed to taking these kids. They all want to have one of these kids in their businesses. So that is an exciting program. Um, yeah, one other program I have to share with you. How cool are these little key rings? <laughs> They're about the most expensive key rings. I was with my friends yesterday, and I gave each of them one. And they said, oh, they're beautiful. I said, and that'll cost you $60 each. Because <laughs> you've just become a friend of Oz Harvest. And a friend of Oz Harvest, you get a key ring, and you get a whole range of benefits. So, for example, I haven't told Vince that. But, you know, maybe if somebody wants services from Vince, he'll give them a, do a, you know, a discount. No, but if you go to the coffee shops or any of our food suppliers or restaurants and we've got special events and a whole range of beautiful things. So if anyone wants to become a friend of Oz Harvest, please tell me. So I could go on forever, but I'm actually going to finish with just a little parable because, because I like it and because I'm talking and I can. <laughs> and, and I think it'll express a little bit about where I think I'm at and where I hope that you will be if you're not already there. So it's during the depression and a man is walking home and it's been weeks since he's had work and his kids and wife are at home and they haven't eaten for weeks and it's another day and there's been no work and there's nothing looking good in the future. And as he walks home, he looks down and on the ground he finds a shiny silver dollar. And with that dollar, he runs to the bakery and spends half a dollar and buys as much, it was during the Depression, I said. He buys as much bread as he can with half a dollar. And with the other half a dollar, he runs to the little flower seller on the corner and buys the biggest bunch of flowers that he can. And he runs, hops, skips all the way home. And he opens the door and he's got the bread and his wife and children see and they grab the bread and they start eating the bread and then his wife looks and says, what? You, you spent money on flowers? What were you thinking? 
and he looks at her and he says, My dearest, the bread is in order for us to survive, but the flowers are to make it worthwhile. I hope each and every one of you find what it is that makes your lives worthwhile. Thank you. Sorry, here all day. Um, Thank you. Do I have any questions to ask from you all? Yes. Do I just want to know um, when you approach your organisations, um, if you ever find being kind of struggling with how cannibal their brand would be with your brand? Absolutely. Or some of it just comes naturally and they just get it. Look, I only really approach people who I think would get and understand our brand. Because, it, you know, a partnership is, it doesn't matter if it's about a friendship or it's about a business partnership. It's about like people with like concepts, like values, and, and, and you actually have to like them. And you actually have to both benefit. So for me, I never would, would approach someone that either I didn't respect, didn't value, or didn't think that there was an alignment. And I think that's a really important thing. It's the same as the way we choose our friends, we choose our partners. And so absolutely, it's very, it's critical. You know, I would not go to a tobacco company. I would not go, you know. <laughs> Shit. If she called and offered me a million dollars, what would I do? I'd, I'd prove to the world that she was a better person. I'd find a way of taking her money. <laughs> It's a big dilemma. No, it really is a big dilemma. But seriously, if I could, if I thought that I would bring value, I might have to change my principles. But but let's put it this way: someone asked if I would meet Clive Palmer, and I said, "No, I'm not interested." I don't think he sounds like such a great guy. So I didn't want to spend time with him. So I probably have the same answer for Gina Reinhardt. But her money is attractive to an organization that needs money. So my board might kill me. But, um, yeah. Any other questions? Or have I shut you all up? Yeah. So is your board made up of your daughters? Like Macquarie and Jim Fox? No, my board has one, only Macquarie. Um, part of their agreement, their funding agreement, was that they have a person on my board. Um, I had the CEO of Lynn Fox on my board because I thought that was wise. Um, he's since stepped off the board because Lynn Fox stopped giving us money and I didn't see the purpose of having him on the board if he couldn't get Lynn Fox to give me money. So they still provide the truck as well? No. Oh, okay. No, they stopped this year. Did they provide a reason? Was it yeah, we didn't match the... You know, we're a transport and logistics company, and they're a transport logistics company, but we didn't fit their criteria. What can you say? You know, I said, thank you very much for the money you've given me. Thank you very much for the help you've given me, and uh, we really appreciate that. So all of our trucks are purchased, but most, I mean, they're purchased with other people's money. Um, Lynn Fox provided, serviced all our vehicles. They gave us money and they serviced all our vehicles, but they've stopped doing that. <laughs> so I did just have a big, long conversation with Toll. Don't know yet. But I will share with you that I did make Mercedes an offer that they couldn't refuse. I said I'd buy one if they gave me one free. <laughs> and they did. <laughs> and they do. <laughs> So, yeah, they get nervous when I tell people that. <laughs> they think everyone will go there. And I said, well, they should all try it. <laughs> They'd sell more cars. <laughs> Any other questions? 20. So, yeah, so it's pretty exciting. 20 in Sydney or 20? No, 20 in total. So we have, I think, 11, I get... I swear I get confused. Yeah, that was in uh, uh, that was last year. In the, it also says that we've delivered 14 million meals, but in the last eight months we've delivered another three, so we're 17 and a half million meals. Um, so we've got three vehicles in Brisbane, three in Adelaide, two in Newcastle, 
one in Melbourne um, because we've just opened in Melbourne and I think the rest in Sydney, however many that is, maybe 11 or 12. I get my adding's not very good. Yeah. So it's really interesting. The interesting thing is that because, so what we do, we, the answer is no. What we do is we don't warehouse anything and we deliver direct from our people to, from the donors to the food recipient. So um, our vans leave empty every morning and come back empty every night. And we keep doing audits to check that the organizations that we give food to don't waste because, I mean, there's not much point giving it to someone else to waste. And, you know, I'm sure that at some level there must be some, you know, a lot less than there would be. But it, at the moment it seems to be, you know, as I say, from doing our checks, we're pretty satisfied that the food is being used. The agencies, when they get pre-cooked food, have to use it within 24 hours. Fresh and pre fresh, you know, fruit, vegetables, um, milk, yogurt, of course, lasts much younger. We can talk about use by dates. That's an interesting one. <laughs> Did any of your grandmothers have a use by date? Did they know when they had to throw away milk? What a ridiculous, what a consumer trick that is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we hope that it's going to happen here, but it's. You know, we're talking, but it's slow and it's... You said, you said earlier that the supermarkets is not their fault, but they can... No, it is, absolutely. Of course they could. And, and of course, in a large part, it is their fault. I mean, they reject wiggly carrots because they don't sit well on a shelf. You know, I mean, the amount of fruit and veg that gets dumped. So we also do gleaning. So we work with farmers, so we've had farmers call us and say that they've got oranges on their trees that cannot, it's, it's too expensive for them to take to market because one, they're not getting a big enough price, two, the supermarkets have refused them because they're too small or too wiggly or too whatever. So we send volunteers out to pick and then we give away their fruit. So we pick up for free and deliver for free. Yeah. When you spoke to the organized making of the bread pudding. Yeah. That was a sort of special Oh absolutely. It was an unusual thing because we don't we don't our model is not to cook. We get huge amounts of corporate engagement. We have corporates often cooking for us. It's a beautiful, beautiful team building event that corporates come and cook in a kitchen and then they have fun and we take the food that they've cooked and give it away. But daily, our model is we collect food, and it might be, you know, full salmons from a Master Chef set, or it could be um, from Woolworths or Aldi, or from a boardroom, Allen's, any of the boardrooms in the city where it's ready made, and then it just goes straight to the agencies. Yeah. Do the recipients have the of like amount of it, or it's like every day you just get whatever is in the it's completely random. However, because now there is so much volume, when we commit that you will get food today for lunch, you'll get food today for lunch. We cannot tell you if it's going to be lasagna. We cannot tell you if it's going to be wagyu beef. And it might be yogurt and an apple and a sandwich. One of our agencies, Newtown Mission, said his people used to eat white bread and jam and bangers and mash. And now they eat gourmet wraps and Thai barramundi. <laughs> Yes. Um, you mentioned that you were pioneers, but yes. that's competitors now? Are there Absolutely. So, tiny, yeah, so first of all, um, in terms of people who've taken our model and worked on it and changed it somewhat but still do that, there's second buy to an organization in Melbourne who started two and a half, three years after we started. Um, they're, they're in Melbourne. There is... The, well, there's nobody doing what we do every day, of the, every day of the week, collecting food from delis and takeaways and boardrooms and hotels and delivering it to people in need. There's nobody doing that professionally every day. There's Second Bite collects fruit and vegetables, and they collect from some supermarkets. But they don't do it every day. I mean, we're in Melbourne. We, got, we thought that 
the supermarket market was covered in Melbourne. We got a call from Woolworths yesterday, would we start collecting from 18 stores? We've been there a week. So there's, we're in Melbourne because there's a huge gap. So there's nobody doing what so we do. Are you in Melbourne like you've got a cupboard? Absolutely. <laughs> so you don't think that in, you know, one of the things, when I went to that person and met with the founder of City Harvest in New York, and the, one of the things she said to me, she said, Ronnie, do not think that there's no politics in this sector. And there is, you know. I don't believe in competition as far as I'm concerned. We do something different to what anybody else does. I don't have to, I'm not threatened about funding because People fund what they need to fund, and our impact drives our income. The fact that every month I'm collecting 480,000, next month it'll be 520,000, that's transparent, that's there, it's measurable. Anyone can come in and look at it. So, you know, let every organization, we don't have it covered. What happened, one of the things when I travel around Australia, people always say to me, can you bring our harvest here? Can you bring our harvest there? Now, our model is a particularly city model because we have paid drivers because we're a transport and logistics company. When, um, whether it's Fratelli Paradiso or whether it's Sopra or whether it's whoever calls and says, can you be there at three? I knew that I couldn't rely on volunteers. I've been a volunteer. And I didn't always pitch when I committed to because that's the nature of a volunteer. So I knew that my drivers need to do, be paid drivers. So the whole, I can't remember what I was saying. What was it oh, about, um, why was I telling you that? It's been a long day. Completely lost it. This has never happened to me before, but I just did lost it. Oh, politics. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And so, you know, it's, it's absolutely prevalent. It's there. Um, I mean, I don't, it's a little awkward for me because somebody before we walked in told me that he works with Second Bite, which I'm very happy for them that they have someone from Second Bite. But quite honestly, I don't think they're thrilled that we're in Melbourne. But quite honestly, they're not picking up the food that we're there to pick up and good luck to them. Oh, what I was telling you was that because I went around Australia and people said, bring us harvest here, and I knew that we couldn't, so we created this beautiful toolkit called um, of how to rescue food. So anyone in regional Australia, anyone in a small community, it's the one, two, three of um, of rescuing food. And if you haven't looked at it, you should, because the way we launched it was we did a hoax viral. So I don't know, some of you might have heard of it. Um, so it's called Reap, and it's our, it's it's brought by Oz Harvest, but it's called Reap, I guess, Reap and Harvest. Um, and the way we launched it was we got Matt Moran. Well, I'll, the history of that launch, very briefly I'll tell you, was Pat Cash once did an ad that he hit a tennis ball off, off somebody's head, missed and hit them in the balls. And that ad went on, but within three days it was like three million hits and then on the third day, you saw that Pat Cash was wearing Bonds. It was an ad for Bonds because he was wearing Bonds knickers when he did it. So when we were going to launch Reap, the film company that were producing a little video for us said, we've got a great idea. Why don't we get Matt Moran in a kitchen and let him do a, as if he's doing a food show. And then when he finishes plating up his plate in between the sets, They'll take the plate, throw it away, let Matt go absolutely feral, like Gordon Ramsay does, and then we'll cut it, we'll put that on YouTube, and hopefully it'll get a lot of noise, and then the rest of the video will be Matt saying, actually, we shouldn't waste food, you know, Reap has just been launched. So we did that, and we, so you have Matt saying, what are you doing? Get, you know, I didn't just make that food, and he just goes mad. And we thought it would take three days, because that's what that other one did. And after four hours, we had 
Channel 9 camped outside our office because they said, I'm sure this has got to do with our harvest. We had, Matt couldn't get near or by Iria. The phones were jammed. And after four hours, it had had already about 500,000 hits because Matt was on MasterChef, so it was perfect timing. We actually released the rest, and it actually got to the Huffington Post. I mean, it had the most extraordinary um, uh, uh, circulation, and that was about our, our toolkit, REAP, which anybody can look at, and, and it's supported by us and their communities now all over Australia who rescue food based on that toolkit and are part of that community. Yeah. No, no, succession, succession, succession. <laughs> you and my board every day. What happens if you get hit over by hit by a bus? I say I avoid buses. Um, no, well, we have a GM, a magnificent GM. I've now got wonderful team and staff, and we're looking at how we, you know, I, I, I won't be this role forever. And we'll find someone who will run Oz Harvest. As I say, I'm not involved as much in the day-to-day -day running of Oz Harvest. I've got magnificent people. I am the face of the brand. I am the spokesperson for the brand. I am the fundraiser for the brand. But we're slowly developing that. Absolutely. It's a hugely critical and crucial, you know. It worked well that I helped build the brand, and now it's time to make us harvest, and I'm, I'm pretty sure, I mean, it, it, it is much bigger than me already, so. Yeah, but a, a very valid question. I don't know when I'll be ready to give the baby away, but <laughs> but I swear that I will, What's you know. The longevity of the organization? Oh, the longevity? Well, that's why we're building all these other programs. I mean, it's not about me. I, I, I believe I'll know when I'm no longer valuable, and I will... I, and if I don't, I hope people will tell me. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I know you're a very busy lady, so thank you so much for coming to the Deep Lust and inspiring us with your story um, and uh, sharing some exciting projects for us. I'm sure I'll tell you when it gets back. Well, well we'll thank you for being our team leader and the person who fields all my calls and says, Mm, okay, next Wednesday. I make sure I get in though. You absolutely <laughs> do. You should. Did you see my car downstairs? Well, have a look. I got so just a little story. A volunteer who works for us. A volunteer who had sold his business after about four weeks was bored shitless, and phoned and said, "Can he come and do some stuff with us?" Worked one day, loved it. Worked two days, loved it. Now comes in two to three days a week, at least ask for permission when he goes on holiday. But unfortunately, about eight weeks ago, he called in and said, I'm on my way to the doctor and then to my lawyer. I've just been diagnosed with lung cancer. So we were pretty devastated because he's just a magnificent man. And we had just done the brand refresh and our vans now look like this. And he saw one of our vans and I drive I drove a red Prius, and about two hours after he'd seen that, he called me. He said, the CEO of Oz Harvest should be in a yellow Prius. Drive to Toyota now and go and buy yourself a yellow Prius. I said, well, that's ridiculous. Uh, let's just paint mine. He said, no, go and buy a new Prius, and I wanted logoed. And it's downstairs, the yellow Prius. And it does say on it with love. He doesn't know yet because he's actually not very well at the moment. I only got it back yesterday. And it says with love from Kev Wallace on both sides of my car. Yeah. Thank you. No, I do enjoy all those phone calls. You're <laughs> such a joy to do with every day. And your thank team's you. amazing. And, uh, thank you so much. A little small gift to say thank you. Thank you so much. No worries. <laughs> So if you haven't seen our Oz Harvest cookbook, if you want to know what to do with leftovers, 44 of Australia's top chefs, beautiful book, $60, 
120 meals we can deliver every time you buy it. Corporate gift, beautiful. <laughs> Have a look. <laughs> Um, they're having our next one in July, which will be Julie Gibbs from Penguin Books. So hope to see you all there. And